Did you ever think when you were a kid that you'd be throwing $150,000 away? No, I never thought I would ever have thought $150,000 or more. It's funny, isn't it? It's, yeah. the, it's the great American dream. Can you believe there was a time when a musical genius tickled the ivories for a mere $3 a week and still managed to inspire the Beatles? Yes, you heard that right. We're talking about none other than the man himself, the one and only Fats Domino. This maestro wasn't just any ordinary rock and roll pioneer. He was part of an elite group who actually knew how to sing before autotune was a twinkle in a producer's eye. And did he ever boast about setting the stage for the fabulous four from Liverpool? Not a peep. In an era when America was tangled up in the knots of segregation and racism, this groundbreaking artist didn't just bring down the house, he tore down walls, merging white and black audiences with his magnetic melodies. A country divided, yet united on the dance floor swaying to the same rhythm under the spell of this musical maestro. Well, let's dive in. Fats Domino was born Antoine Dominique Domino Jr. in the Lower Ninth Ward in New Orleans, Louisiana on February 26, 1928. Domino's parents were of French Creole origin and French was the first language he learned at home. He was the youngest of eight children in the Domino family. And, and now, now you started playing piano when you were just a kid, didn't you? Yeah. How did that How did that get started? Well, my brother-in-law had a, he used to play Papa Celestine band, and he used to play banjo, guitar. He, his name was Harrison Verrett. He the one taught me the chords, and I went from there. It was a musical family. His father was a part-time violin player, and he learned the piano from his brother-in-law, jazz guitarist Harrison Verrett. Fats Domino attended Louis B. McCarty School, but dropped out in fourth grade to find work like so many kids of his generation. He started as a helper to an ice delivery man, worked at the Crescent City Bed Factory making bed springs, and started playing in nightclubs by 14. In 1947, a New Orleans band leader, Billy Diamond, heard the young pianist perform at a backyard barbecue. Diamond was impressed and asked Fats Domino to join his band, The Solid Cinders, at the Hideaway Club in New Orleans. Billy Diamond gave the nickname Fats to young Antoine Domino. And now, now how, long, how long have you been Fats? I mean, how did Antoine Domino become Fats Domino? Well, I was, you know, playing around New Orleans, and a fellow by the name of Billy Diamond, he st I, started, I was kind of small, and I started picking up weight, so he still called me Fats. So when we made my first record, we'd, we'd call me Fat in all those clubs. And I just made a record, and I just called the Fat Man, me and Dave Bartholomew. And uh, he still called me Fat, so when I made my real name is Antoine, you know? Yeah. So I just called me the Fat Man, so I say, well, Fats Domino. That's how he became the famous Fats Domino. Want to know how much he earned? Fats Domino started his musical career playing the piano for $3 a week. But of course, it was 1949 and things were very different from today's world. Fats Domino is not exactly the poster boy of rock and roll physique like Elvis the Pelvis Presley. We're talking about a guy who was 5'5", tipping the scales way past the 200 mark, and yet, get this, racked up sales over 110 million records. Yeah, you heard that right. This man was a music selling machine, securing his spot in the top 10 of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame's inaugural inductees. Remember Blueberry Hill and Ain't It a Shame? Classics, right? In the golden era of the 1950s, only Elvis managed to outshine him in the sales department. There's only one person that sold more records than you. Yeah, but I heard. That was my boy Elvis. Yeah. Yeah. But here's where it gets juicy. Domino wasn't just about the vocals. The man was a showman. Ever heard of a pianist performing standing up? Fats didn't just stand. He rocked, he rolled, he literally pushed pianos across the stage with the sheer force of his rhythm. And okay, maybe his belly helped out a little bit. Imagine a finale so dramatic, so over the top, that it ends with the piano collapsing on stage in a grand spectacle of music and mayhem. Yes, that happened. Our man Fats went a tad too far one night, turning his signature move into a demolition derby. The aftermath? A busted piano, a fuming promoter, and a bill that Fats had to foot for his enthusiastic artistry. 
Who says rock and roll isn't a contact sport? In 1949, Fats Domino made a savvy move by signing with Imperial Records, opting for a slice of the pie, royalties, over crumbs, a flat fee per song. Together with his partner in crime, producer Dave Bartholomew, they penned The Fat Man, an upbeat tune about drug addicts that surprisingly became a rock and roll millionaire in sales, not dollars, by 1951. That's right, it was the first rock record to hit a million sales, making it the Elvis of vinyls before Elvis was even Elvis. Fat's tunes had the power to bring people together, but occasionally, he had to face the not-so-swinging tunes of 1950s America's conservative and, let's not mince words, racist society. Case in point, November 2nd, 1956, Fayetteville, North Carolina, picture a typical Fat's Domino gig jam-packed with an eager black and white crowd ready to rock and roll. But then, a scuffle breaks out. Zero to chaos in no time, leading to the grand entrance of the police, who, in a move that's more action movie than concert finale, decides tear gas is the way to go. Cue the tear gas-induced stampede, with fans running for the exits like it's a Black Friday sale. The media? They jumped on the bandwagon faster than you can say misinterpretation, branding the chaos a race riot. But here's the kicker. The whole brouhaha had nothing to do with race. Meanwhile, Fats Domino and a couple of his bandmates were pulling off their own stunt, diving out of a window. A daring escape from the mayhem, though not without a few scrapes and bruises. The rumor mill suggested the melee was sparked by the explosive combo of mixed audiences, alcohol, dancing, and the races mingling like ingredients in a cocktail shaker. Despite Fat's best efforts to smooth over racial tensions with his music, his concerts became somewhat notorious for riots, notching up three more to his name. Who knew rock and roll could be so riotous? After the incident, Fats Domino told a reporter, I never would use dirty lyrics and I don't use body movements either. I just play the piano or I sing and clap my hands. Frequent riots became a concern when he was banned from performing at Griffith Stadium in Washington, D.C. in August 1957 due to security concerns raised by city commissioner Robert McLaughlin. Fats Domino lived with racism throughout his entire career. In the 1950s, his team sometimes drove for hours before finding a hotel accepting black customers. Can you imagine that in today's concept? Fats Domino starred in The Girl Can't Help It, a highly influential early rock film. But he wasn't even allowed to sit with the other VIPs when he attended the movie's premiere. Just imagine, Fats Domino was the star of the movie. But Domino didn't complain about those injustices. I just stick to my music, he said when asked about the civil rights movement. Domino's last top 10 hit, Walkin' to New Orleans, came in 1960, and his career slowed down and started to fade away in the 1970s, with many new entrants to the music scene and a reduced flow of record content from Fats Domino. He finally retired from touring in 1996. In contrast to many rock and roll musicians at the time, Fats Domino took Till Death Do Us Part to heart sticking with his darling Rosemary Hall for a whopping six decades. Together, their union produced eight kids. But this wasn't just any assembly line. Oh no, they decided to add a twist to their production model. Every child would come stamped with a name beginning with the letter A. That's right, eight little masterpieces, each with an A. It's as if they were aiming for the alphabet, but got so enchanted with the first letter, they thought, why bother with the rest? When on tour, Fats was his own chef, toting around his trusty rice and beans for a do-it-yourself feast. Why? Because Fats had a strict, if I didn't cook it, I don't trust it policy. And strangers, nope, he wasn't about chit-chatting with people he hadn't personally vetted. This, of course, meant his hotel neighbors often got a whiff of his culinary escapades, whether they liked it or not. Imagine being on road 340 days a year, raking in $2,500 a night, and your biggest concern is where to cook your beans. Talk about priorities. Fat loves to cook. 
Enter the Domino Kitchen, or should I say the bathroom? Our culinary maverick, Fats Domino, decides the best place to whip up his legendary red beans isn't the kitchen. It's the bathroom, next to his bedroom, on a two-burner grill, no less. Imagine stepping into this scene. A treadmill commandeered as a makeshift towel rack, bath towels, dish towels, and a counter besieged by an eclectic mix of toiletries, kitchen utensils, and, because why not, onions. Why would a music icon choose to cook beans in the bathroom? In a twist that could only make sense to a genius, Fats wanted to spare his wife and daughter the horror of a kitchen Armageddon, so he opted for the bathroom, ensuring he always cooked enough beans to feed an army, regardless of whether he was dining solo. Seriously, who else but Fats Domino could turn a bathroom into the hottest beanery in town? The man wasn't just a rock and roll pioneer, he was a culinary innovator with a flair for the dramatic. Oh, and just for kicks, Fats was also a closet fashionista, boasting a collection of 50 suits, and not 10, not 20, but 100 pairs of shoes. Because what's a rock and roll legend without a little flair, right? Though a modest man who never spoke about his achievements, Fats Domino knew precisely what he wanted to do and with whom he wanted to spend his time. When the Rolling Stones came to New Orleans, Mick Jagger wanted to meet Fats Domino. When we were in um, Storyville in New Orleans, I had the great fortune of playing alongside Ray Charles, Jerry Lee Lewis, and Fats Domino, all on the same stage doing gumbo soup or whatever the name of the song was. Yeah, I was in Fats' trailer and um, he said to me, does my attire match my shoes? And I said, yeah, I think it does, Fats. It looks pretty nice to me. And we all went back to his house afterwards for, for gumbo. I want to play you Ain't That a Shame because it was uh, 1955 million seller. Fats used to uh, feed all the homeless people. They used to be queuing outside his house. And once he had his jewelry stolen, which meant the world to him, all of his diamonds and all his domino-shaped stuff that he had. He went into a depression for a couple of weeks, and then some of the local hoods uh, got together with the guy that had, had uh, done the, the theft, and they had a word with him, and they said, you can't steal from the fat man, you know, you've got to return his jewellery. So, sure enough, uh, F Fats heard the doorbell go one day and went to the door, and then a plastic bag full of all of the missing stuff was back and he immediately sprung out of his depression. I just want to shake his hand and say thank you, but Fats would have none of it. He replied, oh Lord, I got my beans on, I don't know. Surprised? Yeah, Fats Domino did not want to meet the world's biggest band, the Rolling Stones. In 2005, Hurricane Katrina is playing bowling with neighborhoods, including that of rock and roll legend Fats Domino. Suddenly, Fats becomes the world's most unexpected Houdini, disappearing into thin air. Days tick by, and just when you think it's the end of the record for Fats, ta-da, he's spotted atop his roof, the ultimate roof party with his family in tow. But of course the plot thickens. His home in Ninth Ward? Trashed. Three pianos, 20 gold records, poof. Gone with the wind or looted or maybe on an unplanned aquatic adventure. And his response, cool as a cucumber, Fats Domino declares, I ain't missing nothing. Just one thing that happened, I guess. Talk about the understatement of the century. You know, a lot of people were, were worried about you. They thought you were gone. What happened when the water came up? I went out. You went, went out. Went, I went down, down the road. Fats Domino received the Grammy Lifetime Achievement Award in 1986 and on November 5th, 1998, he was awarded the National Medal of Arts by President Bill Clinton at the White House. Rolling Stone magazine ranked him 25th on its 100 Greatest Artists of All Time list in 2004. Fats Domino passed away peacefully on October 24th, 2017 at 89 in Barclay Estates, Louisiana, very close to the house he grew up in as a kid, with his family surrounding him at the time of his passing. Rock and Roll Hall of Fame class alongside Elvis Presley and Chuck Berry and James Brown. He helped create the music. Throughout his career, he never left his hometown, often got homesick during tours, and thought nothing of blowing a gig to return to New Orleans. I, I, I love to live here, period. And uh, even though it changed, but it don't bother me. And, and what do you like best about New Orleans? 
I like everything. I like the people, number one. And I like the food. I like everything with New Orleans. Was he the most underrated rock and roll artist in history? Fats Domino's net worth is hitting a cool eight and a half million in 2024. How's that for a standing ovation from the afterlife? It seems the man's been busier than ever, juggling music sales, concerts, well, sort of, merchandise, and even real estate from the great beyond. Who knew you could flip houses without lifting a finger? Despite having left the building, Fats Domino's tunes are still spinning, proving that good music never really dies. It just earns royalties. His influence on the music scene is as undeniable as his knack for posthumous entrepreneurship. His legacy, it's not just alive and kicking, it's thriving and investing, making sure Fat's bank account is as buoyant as his beats. So next time you catch yourself toe-tapping to Ain't That a Shame or Blueberry Hill, just remember, you're contributing to the Fats Domino empire. The man might have left the stage, but his net worth? It's doing the twist, the boogie, and probably planning to buy a yacht. Now that's what I call a lasting impact on the music world.